either we shall all perish or we shall have to acquire some slight degree of common sense. Burton Russell said this in 1945, after the detonation of Nagasaki by the Americans. He was talking about the human race. But if you replace the we with an I, he might as well have been talking about student life. Now, let's focus on the intended interpretation for a minute. If you think about it, he wasn't too off. Take the biggest killer we face today, climate change. Now, the reason why climate change is such a big issue is that we often tend to ignore the scope of the problem. For example, all of you here must have burned fossil fuels on your way coming to this event. The glasses I'm wearing right now needed energy to make. And most likely, this energy came from the burning of fossil fuels. It's not a problem like CFCs, where it's just one chemical that's causing all the that, all damage. Rather, it's our entire social system that is to blame. What's worse, no one can bother to solve a problem that is far into the future. For example, how many of you here use a phone that's older than three years old? For reference, it's something older than an iPhone 11. Wow, that's lower than I expected. And how many of you here have made this choice because you know that getting a new phone has significant environmental costs associated with it? Wow, only a couple of the greenest hands in the room over there are up. But in general, what we see is that no one cares. The, and even when people seem to care and say that they might actually do stuff, there's no guarantee that they will actually take action. So far, our report card is pretty poor. And we haven't even got to the other risks yet. These risks have been quite widely studied and classified into two groups by experts. Natural threats and man-made threats. Now, natural threats are those that are inherent in the space around us. These include things like supervolcanic eruptions, asteroid strikes, or hostile extraterrestrial life. But what experts think will kill us the first, or at least threaten to kill us the first, are man-made threats. These include things like global nuclear annihilation, ecological collapse, biological warfare, or artificial intelligence wiping out humanity. I've said all of this, but how does it matter to you? These threats might be thousands of years away, and they don't stop you from enjoying your life to the fullest. After all, according to the theory of the universe that we have understood so far, we will eventually come to our end along with the heat death of the universe. But this is a question you can ask on the personal level, too. Remember the generality of Burton Russell's statement? Why should you students be bothered about perishing in the workplace? Why can't you just let your hair down now, now that you're free from the demands of employment? Why? You should care, and we should care, because the future is built on the past, and only the past. We take it step by step at school. Ever since we came here, we've been prepared to go for work. We can't just postpone all that learning to the one week before the job interview. It's not going to work. Similarly, when we consider the context of humanity as a whole, this applies more broadly and more powerfully. Because of ev evolution, our societies today are based on what our societies were like yesterday. And yesterday can't be too drastically different from today. If I woke up today morning and saw a world around me, dazzling, white, filled with lumps of vanilla ice cream, I just started having mouthfuls of that. Wait, no, 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 no. I would actually freak out immediately. Where did all the ice cream come from? And this is such a banal example. To survive, we're not going to be talking about ice cream, unfortunately, but rather radical societal change, a complete turnaround in the way we organize ourselves. Now, while Hollywood definitely does a good job of imagining the threats we face, us mortals 
tend to have a slightly harder time of it. Now, got this bottle here, not because I get particularly thirsty, but rather because it's a surprisingly good analogy for the threats we face. Observe this bottle flip. The amount of swing this bottle has is exactly dictated by my hands, which in turn influences the amount of rotation it gets when it's released. If it has the right amount of rotation, right amount of water in the bottle, and right amount of time in the air, it'll be a successful flip. But now enough with the talking. Let's get on with it. Ready? No one saw that. <laughs> so the reason why bottle flipping is so exciting is because it depends on a very fine balance between the different variables that affect it. Because of this, it's very difficult to influence a bottle by the right degree. There's always an uncertainty in whether we got the flip right. This is the essence of chaos theory. Now, when we talk about our futures, there's a similar uncertainty that we face. We can influence all the variables, like the temperature of our atmosphere, or the equality of our societies, but there's always an uncertainty in whether we did the right thing or not. The reason for this comes down to the uncertainty in predicting the future. The future tends to be very hard to predict. Now, you can see the outcome of the bottle flip as whether we survive or not. If I get the bottle flip right, we survive. But the difference is, while we can do the bottle flip again and get better at it, we really do not have a second chance with this. And even the best of us can blow the chance we have. I want to tell you a true story of one of the most revolutionary mathematicians of all time. He's also a wonderful philosopher and logician. It's, it takes us back to the 20th century. I'm not going to name our protagonist, only his story matters. He was so overwhelmed about the loss of his friend after he got assassinated that he was he refused to eat any food that was not tasted by his wife first. The other reason he had for this was his digestive ailment in the form of a bleeding ulcer. So when his wife fell sick, he unfortunately refused to eat anything. He was so overwhelmed by the persecutory delusion that he'd be vulnerable to attack if he did. Because of this, he eventually died the unfortunate death of starvation. All this happened not because he wasn't a wise man, rather the contrary, but because he got locked into place by human psychology. He was so paranoid about the present that he became completely apathetic of the future. Our biggest enemy is not our capability, but rather our psychology and social organization. Now, these are very difficult things to overcome, but I do still believe that we can get the better of these. But I also believe that we can't overcome these if we don't achieve three things first. Now, these, thre these three steps also turn out to be useful when it comes to surviving at school. I know, I know. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? And it kind of is. These three steps are not a painstakingly detailed guide of what we need to do to survive, but rather, they're just a set of guidelines, tools to get you thinking in the right direction and progressing in the right way. So step one is engagement. If there's a strong interest to take action to survive or to improve, it becomes easier to do so. For this, we need two things, a goal and good leadership. Recently, I injured my abdomen, and unfortunately, this was during the exams. So for three weeks, I could not work out at all. But I said to myself at the end of this, I don't want to decline. I want to maintain the level of fitness that I once had. So I said this as my goal. This is what got me up at six, almost every morning, to go for a workout. And I'm glad to say that it is helping. I feel that I can recover that level of fitness that I once had. I feel motivated. And I'm sure that if we are motivated enough, we can heal our societies no matter how much they damage. The second thing we need is good leadership. 
you being consistent and maintaining a positive attitude goes a long way. That is what I found out through my journey. But when we consider the more global scale, things get complicated. We need people in organizations that can deliver upon the promises they make. But this does not just happen with the people and organizations. You need the entire community to be engaged. Everyone needs to be involved in the decision making so that successes are celebrated and failures are punished. Step two, think freely and rationally. Unfortunately, this is not tend to happen spontaneously. It's a math problem never come around to solving. Really need to think through it well. When I started working out, I started working out extremely slowly. It was nothing like the routine I had before. This is because I knew that if I were to improve, it would come at the cost of getting an injury again. So I rationalized my situation. I said to myself, I'm going to go slowly. And I think because, of, because I adapted to the circumstances, I was able to recover quickly. In terms of our communities, we need a situation where our political intelligence, similar to the intelligence we have on a personal level, matches scientific intelligence. Aristotle believed that political intelligence is the mastermind behind scientific intelligence. Only if we have political systems that encourage the flourishing of science can we keep up with the demands of our changing world. Now, we have the components in place. We need to put them together. We need to weave the social fabric. This brings us to our third step, unity. Our earliest roots came from a world where our ancestors did not have jealousy or spite. They just wanted each of them to do the best for their communities. They were not driven by the need to improve their personal stature. Instead, they were programmed like animals. They were programmed to do the best for the common good. In our world today, innovation tends to be driven by pride or fame or wealth. It's never for the sake of making a better future, or it's very rarely the case. We need to give people incentives to make this happen. Now, if we are to solve the puzzle of our existential threats, we need to put all the right pieces into the right places. And it's only if we use all the pieces that we have can we solve the puzzle. So if you ask me, will we survive? According to me, the answer does not depend on the number of threatening events we face, but rather on how we prepare to deal with them when they strike. It's not impossible, but it's not anything else either. If we want to rise to the challenge, as Burton Russell said, we shall have to acquire some slight degree of collective common sense. Thank you.